There's something called the mathematical sublime, which is about the failure of the imagination to perceive the subject, which is too big for us to wrap our imagination around. And then the subsequent triumph of reason to quantitatively analyze and understand it using science. And I think the really interesting thing about the mathematical sublime is that we should be able to do the same today in regards to climate change, because the reports have come in, yet our powers of reason are failing us. So this is what I call a kind of broken sublime. In our previous episode, we met the visionary artists charged with bringing to light the crises facing humanity today. From AI and AR to biotechnology and robotics, these creative revolutionaries have helped us understand the realities facing our planet and the consequences we face by ignoring them. In this episode, we'll meet the modern artists whose work goes beyond predicting the future, but instead explores the ways we can shape it. From the gruesome beauty of a rainforest under threat to digital landscapes shaped by personal data, these pioneers are pushing science and art to the limits of what's normal to ask the question, what drives us forward? Art has long helped humanity to better understand the world around us. Now, with the advent of new technologies, artists can go even further to create connections between the audience and the forces which threaten them. But how is their interpretation a reflection of ourselves? There are different philosophies of technology, and the current Western philosophy is kind of in the what's called the deterministic trend, so technology will determine our futures. But it's often ignored by the fact that the choices around the technologies were made by certain groups of people with certain kinds of objectives. Industrialization, capitalism, materialism, and the technologies are holding all of those philosophies within them. So the current structure of technologies is quite hurtful. Before I began my work in the Amazon documenting deforestation, I actually was working in Ecuador trying to photograph what we stand to lose. And what I did is I went into the rainforest at night with ultraviolet lamps and I pointed them at the fungi and the lichens and mosses and the textures of the floor of the rainforest. Everything glows and fluoresces when you use these lights. It's the most magical thing I've ever seen and also somehow gruesome. A really aggressive place to be, a frightening place. And when you light them up with fluorescent lights, it becomes unfamiliar. You feel alienated from what you're looking at. When you start to feel like you're in a different galaxy, it's a kind of weird gothic sci-fi world. And yeah, I think photography has the power to disarm us and show us the beauty of the natural world. And that's what I tried to do, you know, I was quite exhausted. I work quite hard and I travel a lot and I go to some depressing places and try to report on human suffering. And for that project, I kind of wanted to hit the reset button and spend several months in eco lodges staring at beautiful aspects of the rainforest. And it was very restorative. You know, I feel like anything challenging for a group of people, it affects all they thought was real. And for another group of people, it's just a confirmation of what they were already dealing with. So, you know, like I think borders is like one of the most kind of like subjective reality. Everyone has a very different relationship to what a border is. For example, if I talk about my experience, I can't really go visit my family because I'm not sure I can come back. I don't necessarily think that new tools are needed to solve political issues. I do think new methodologies are maybe more precise in understanding the boundary between you know, activism and art and understanding which discipline does what better. Art can really help in disseminating very specific and very professionalized knowledge, and it can help make it a bit more accessible to a wider audience. In my work, I am very interested in moments when people take over infrastructure or common spaces and start creating their own economies. And sometimes there are moments when they escape an economy of scarcity. And I feel like one very important question to grapple with is how to go beyond these isolated moments that are very small in scale and think of larger sustainable forms of existing alternatively. The ways in which violence takes invisible forms uh, continues to mutate and change. With technology particularly, we see kind of new mutating forms of violence emerging. And so the kind of classical sense of violence is quickly becoming outmoded as we have to discover and reveal violence in its more invisible and insidious forms. How do we collectively 
understand our responsibility as shapers and creators of the world around us when the things that we put into the world often with the best of intentions um, end up having unanticipated consequences that aren't just inconvenient but in some cases are actually fatal. I think technology and new media has shaped a way of experiencing the world in general. And we get used to things that are surrounding us, and we're surrounded by a lot of this violence, so we see it as normal. My questioning as species is, why are we this way? Why we don't uh, stop and question ourselves and the reality to make it different. If we could be able to see what happened everywhere in the real time, maybe we will be more conscious about what's really happening when you democratize technology. And we will be the watchdogs of everybody else instead of just being watched by a big either company or governmental structure. So I'm interested in the idea that there is an alienation in the urban condition right now. And so for me, as an artist, what's important is to interrupt those narratives of homogenization, of globalization, and allow people to have the specificity to be able to represent themselves and have connections with disparate communities. In so doing, I think that the politics that emerge from it are the politics of action as opposed to the politics of ideology. We are seeing the results of leaders who do not believe in science and they don't have fact-based policies. How we deal with a nation state is a big question. Democratic institutions are undermined on a daily basis. And so we need people mobilized. And I think that we can make evident these systems of control and try to, to our very best of our ability, resist them. The biggest problems that I focus on are inequality and injustice. And I find that those are the result of authoritarianism and corruption. In those societies, there's no opportunity for people to develop their own skills. And when you have a situation like that, then people are desperate. And that, I believe, is, is very often the source of people who follow extremist ideologies. They live in a place where they can't advance, where they aren't allowed to think independently, to take a step forward forward. The emergence of the internet heralded a new era for human interaction. Inspired by this new connection, social media and video technology proliferated, and now, for better or worse, our lives are online. How are artists grappling with this complicated relationship between our privacy and the digital landscape? I think the interesting question is, will privacy remain at all? And do we want it to? I'm really interested in whether we're gonna start having collective form of privacy, like we'll be defended as groups or in our relationships to each other. And also the way our bodies and ourselves are getting proliferating online. Like for example, I have so many identities. You might be like more than one person. In fact, you're even more than one person in a data set. Those things really impact that kind of model of privacy. So right now, I'm really concerned about the way media infrastructures might be making us think and what the fate of a plural, diverse democracy will be. Most of my works are addressing the phenomenon of collective intelligence in nature and in society. And technology allows me to develop installations and sculptures that are evoking this dealing of magic and something that is imperceptible or difficult to explain. Artificial intelligence algorithms allow me to work with aggregation and mining of very large data sets of information about social movements. This allows me to explore the phenomenon of collective intelligence. Many people who do not use social media or the internet think that they are not being surveyed. But surveillance capitalism is actually surveying everyone. It's enough to own a credit card to already leave some kind of digital footprints. Anya and I create immersive experiences. They often merge creative technology, environments, and performance art. These tend to envelop people physically, but what's more important to us is that we envelop them both psychologically and emotionally as well. All of the privacy issues that we're discussing today, there are many different ways uh, that we can begin to solve this. The first thing is awareness. People have to understand and have literacy around technology and how it is present in the ways 
that it's harmful and the ways that it's helpful. Once people have an awareness, then they can also push back on law and missing legal structure that is needed to protect ourselves. I think that the key themes behind my art are explorations of the nature of nothingness and also the entanglement and merging of physical and digital worlds. It's about communication and how communication can take shape. I think one of the biggest problems related to privacy is probably the internet itself. I think it's warming with algorithms that extract our personal data for profit, manipulation, and so on. So the more someone or something knows about us, the more power they can have over us. So I feel that the internet is broken when it comes down to privacy and without privacy, democracy just loses its meaning. As an artist, it's not only about filling up space, it's also about taking stuff away. And so I think trying to find a balance between that, I think it's essential. The antidote for surveillance capitalism is care. It's the collective and collaborative work that we all can do to get us somewhere outside of the surveillance state, something that looks like a bit more to be free from these technologies that could be helpful, but in some cases, they could be quite detrimental. The work of the artist is to make revolution irresistible. And there is something about the work that does bring joy. It makes me at least think that we can get out of this situation Situation, we can create something else. Privacy itself is constantly evolving together with our social technological environment and the ways that we advocate for a sense of privacy should evolve accordingly. That said, I don't necessarily think that this means we have to use like cutting edge technology. It can also be that we have to go back to ancient modes of storytelling and kind of reinvent them. I think this combination of finding a mode which is somehow appropriate for our current moment is definitely something we, we need to think about.